we're now going to look at the remedies for a tort as opposed to the remedies for a breach of contract. There are three remedies for breach of contract as we discussed. Those remedies are damages, restitution, specific performance. In the case of a tort, there are also three remedies for a tort. Those three remedies for a tort are damages, restitution, and injunction instead of specific performance. Damages, restitution, injunction. But the details behind each of these type, each type of uh, remedy, damages, restitution, injunction, the details are different than the details for breach of contract. In the case of tort damages, the damages fall into two categories. Compensatory damages and punitive damages. Compensatory damages are all so-called out-of-pocket damages. And the idea uh, behind compensatory damages in tort law is to try to put the injured person back in the position they would have been in if the injury had not occurred, if the damage, if the tort had not been committed. And so this means if you uh, negligently injure or damage someone's car, then if you repair the car, that puts them in the position they would have been in if the tort had not occurred. Uh, if their body was injured and they had medical bills, you pay the medical bills. Even things like pain and suffering, we try to reduce those to dollar amounts also. To try to put the injured party in the position they would have been in if the tort had not happened. Those kinds of damages in tort law are referred to as out of pocket. The concept here being that you take your car to the repair shop, it costs you a thousand dollars to the repair, you reach in your pocket, pay the person a thousand dollars, and now that's your out of pocket loss. You want to get that back. Those are compensatory damages. Those damages must be actual, causal, foreseeable, unavoidable. We need to talk about these a little bit more in just a minute particularly the foreseeability one. But we'll come back and deal with these four. The other type of damage for committing it towards punitive damages. Of course, punitive damages apply only when it is an intentional tort, as opposed to, say, negligence. An intentional tort, and the intentional tort must be committed with malice in order to get punitive damages. So for punitive damages, you need an intentional tort committed with malice. Now, um, so that's what we do about damages in the case of tort law. Uh, we need to come back and talk about actual causal foreseeable unavoidable. And we will. The next type of remedy you may get for a tort is restitution. Now, the idea behind restitution again, is to prevent people from being unjustly enriched. Prevent unjust enrichment. That's the whole idea behind restitution, whether you're talking about restitution in contract law or restitution in tort law. It's just that the things you do to prevent unjust enrichment in tort law are a little different from the things you do to prevent unjust enrichment in a contract case. In a contract case, what is usually happen is one person has conferred some benefit on the other person. And now that recipient of the benefit will be unjustly enriched unless you have them compensate for it. And that's basically what uh, restitution is about in contract law. However, in tort law, restitution is to prevent unjust enrichment. And in tort cases, most of the time, people have not uh, intentionally handed somebody a benefit. Someone may have stolen something uh, and such things, so they don't, you don't normally hand people benefits in these cases. And so uh, the tort restitution is going to be different. Let's talk about tort restitution. Well, say, so what do we have? If someone is occupying your real property and you want it back, well, you, one way to restore yourself back to your property is ejectment. That is, you go to 
the law of courts and you do what you have to to get the courts to eject the person. Suppose someone has your personal property instead of real property and you want to get that back. You want to do it through it. Well, obviously you can go there with your gun and get it back that way. We're talking about through the court system at the moment. You go through the court system, uh, this is the pleasant. People spell out differently. So if uh, you have my painting and I want it back, I can go to court and uh, uh, petition it through the sue for the pleven. The pleven is where the court tells the sheriff, go out to your house and get the painting off your wall and bring it back. The court tells the sheriff, go out to your house and get the car and bring it back here. In the ejectment case, the court tells the sheriff, go out there and kick those people off of the real property so that you can restore it to the rightful owner. That's your ejectment. So in both of those cases, these are remedies at law. They're not equitable remedies. They're remedies at law. The law courts are telling the sheriff, go and perform this thing. Now, um, other devices for getting your stuff back, um, self-help, You can use self-help to get your stuff back so long as you do not breach the peace. And you can breach the peace if the person, uh, if you catch the person trying to take your stuff and you struggle to keep it, then the breach of peace is okay in that case. But once they have uh, uh, custody of it and you want it back, if you see your car on the street, you can just go drive it off. Okay? Uh, but you can't breach the peace in order to uh, use the self-help. So that's another way to get your stuff back. Uh, another way to get your stuff back is um, through uh, uh, a constructive trust. How do you do that? Well, and it, what it constru- uh, let's talk about a trust first of all. A trust is a situation where uh, I have some property and I hand this property to a third party called a trustee. And I say to the trustee, I want you to hold the title to this property that I'm giving you. I want you to hold the title, but what I want you to do with all this money is take the income from it or follow whatever other instructions I tell them. But typically, I might say, take the income from it and give it to my friend Mary every month. Well, that has created a trust. The person I gave the money to is the trustee. Mary is the beneficiary. I am the trustor. I'm also called the settle lord. And so that's how we create a trust. Somebody else has got the title, but it's for the benefit of Mary. Now, let me suppose that uh, the uh, that uh, I am wrongfully withholding your property. Okay, I've got money or other property that belongs to you. And I won't give it back to you. So you go to court. You say, court, please make Emerson give it back. Well, one way the court can make me give it back is to say, Emerson, you know that uh, $100,000 in the bank account, but you know that land, black acre, you know that airplane, whatever the property might be, that that title is in Emerson's name right now. But the court says, you've got the title all right, but starting right now, you hold that title as a mere trustee. You don't hold it for yourself. You hold the title, but it's for the benefit of somebody else. And that somebody else is the person who complained. If you sued me because I was holding your property, one remedy is the court might say, Emerson, you now hold that property as a trustee. And, uh, and we've just created this trust, the court would say. And this kind of trust that the court just created is called a constructive trust. So the court just created this constructive trust, made me the trustee, and made you the beneficiary. And the court said, now, Ernestine, you are the trustee of this property, and uh, you have certain trust duties. Let me tell you what these trust duties are. Your trust duty is to convey this property to the beneficiary 
in the next 30 days. Convey black acre to you in the next 30 days. Convey the million dollars to you in the next 30 days. Uh, um, the, uh, the, the, give the painting to you in the next 30 days. So one way to make me give you the stuff back is to declare I hold it as the trustee of a constructive trust and my one duty is to give it to you. If I don't give it to you, now I have reached a trust duty and you can do several things, contempt of court and so forth. So that's one way. Uh, creating a constructive trust is one way for you to get your property back. Another way for you to get it back is the equitable lien. The equitable lien uh, is a doctrine that is used when the person who's got your property, uh, when the, the person has your property but um, they, uh, they don't have the title. Uh, they, they did, well, they may have the title, but they didn't, use, they didn't use your money to get the title. Let me give you an example. I own Black Acre that has a house on it. And I have uh, embezzled $10,000 from you. So now what I do with your $10,000 is I put a new roof on my house. Well, your $10,000 was not used to get the title to the house. Therefore, you cannot use a constructive trust because I don't have title to whatever, you know, whatever. If I use your $10,000 to buy a car and I got the title to the car, okay, then the court could say, Emerson, you now hold the title to the car as the trustee of a constructive trust. But if I use your $10,000 to put a new engine in my Rolls Royce, I did not use your money to get the title. And so I'm not you can't make me the trustee because I don't have a title. If I use your $10,000 to put a new roof on my house, okay, then you can't, uh, you, you, uh, you don't get a, uh, a constructive trust on my house because I didn't use your 10000 to get the title to the house. I just used it to make an improvement. And so you can see your $10,000 is tied up in my house, but it wasn't used to get the title. When I use your money to put a new engine in my Rolls Royce, your ten thousand dollars is used, you know, is now in my Rolls, but it wasn't used to get the title. So in those cases, you are limited to using an equitable lien. You have a very high priority lien on my house. You have a very high priority lien on my Rolls Royce because your stuff is in there. And that high priority lien means that you could foreclose on that property and you would take the first $10,000 that came out of it. Okay. Now, um, so that's what an equitable lien is about. Uh, you can see how uh, some strategy might be used here. If I took your $10,000 and I bought a new fancy racing Plymouth with an uh, antique car, I bought it for ten thousand and got a good deal. It's really worth twenty-five thousand dollars. So I use your ten thousand to buy the antique car, and you uh, uh, is now worth twenty-five thousand. If you see, if you get a constructive trust, then I used your ten thousand to buy the antique car, and that's like your car. I'm almost like your agent. I used your money to buy this car for you. And now the car is worth twenty-five thousand. It's your car, and that's it. Okay. You see, you see. Otherwise, if you let me keep the increase in cost and in price, then I benefit from my own crookedness. So, in the case of a constructive trust, I use your ten thousand to buy this antique car. It's worth twenty-five. The whole car is yours. Uh, but suppose I use your ten thousand and bought this antique car. Instead of it becoming worth twenty-five thousand, oops, it's only worth six thousand. It's only worth six thousand. It went down and down. Well, again, if you use a constructive trust, that's your car, and I bought it for you. It's now worth six thousand. You get the car, and your ten thousand dollar claim is satisfied by the car, even though the car is only worth six thousand dollars. So if you use a constructive trust, you're going to get the title to whatever you're claiming, and it's going to discharge that much of your debt, whatever much of your money 
went into buying that car or that what it is. But uh, if, on the other hand, I use your $10,000 and I get the title to this uh, car and the value of the car goes down, so it's only worth 6000 I buy some stock and it went down to 6000 I buy a black acre, it goes down in value to $6,000. If instead of you using a constructive trust, you have the option of using an equitable lien, and in that case you can foreclose on the property, sell it for the $6,000, get your $6,000, and now you're still owed four more thousand. Now you're not a priority creditor anymore because your 4000 is just you know, in the in the general debt of the of the person, but um, but if you use an equitable lien, then uh, if it's gone down in value, you'd be better off to use an equitable lien because at least you still become a regular creditor for a balance of four thousand dollars. If you use an equitable lien, you'd be better off if it goes down in value. If it goes up in value, obviously you're better off to use a constructive trust and get the benefit of the increased value. So. Equitable lien and constructive trust are devices you can use to get your property back. What else can you use to get yourself restored to get your property back? Well, uh, the uh, one device that you can use is got a couple of names. One name is, uh, let, me, let me tell you about the situation for your names. Consider the situation. Uh, the uh, uh, you uh, have decided to, uh, to 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 meet me up, and uh, and so for whatever reason, and so you hire Joe to do this, and Joe uh, you pay Joe a thousand dollars, and you say Joe go beat up Emerson. Joe goes and beats up Emerson, gets his thousand dollars from you. Now, uh, I find out about this. Now, you must agree that I can sue you or Joe or both for what happened. There's no question about that. I can sue, and let's suppose I've got $20,000 worth of damages. So I sue for $20,000. I can sue you. I can sue Joe. Either one gets the 20000 I got my 20000 from either one of you. Now, problem here. The problem is that Joe got paid a thousand dollars to go out and commit a, an intentional tort. Joe got paid to commit an intentional tort. You gonna let him keep that money? Or do you think that ought to be against public policy? And the general rule is that it's against public policy. So Joe got hired, paid money to commit this intentional tort and so he's got a thousand dollars for doing that. What are we going to do about it? Answer: I'm the victim. I can sue Joe for that thousand dollars. Now, when I sue Joe for the thousand dollars, you can see that when I take that thousand, this is in addition to the twenty thousand damages, quite completely separate, independent, in addition to the twenty thousand I got for my damages, maybe even some punitive damages. But right now. Uh, the problem is that Joe has been paid a thousand dollars to commit this intentional tort. And we don't want to let him keep it. So what are we going to do about it? You let me sue Joe and take the thousand dollars away from Joe. Now when I take that thousand dollars away from Joe, you can see that is not restitution. Because I'm not being restored anything that used to be mine. So it's not real restitution in this case. But the policy is you don't want to let Joe keep the thousand dollars. So the policy is to allow me to sue Joe, to take the thousand dollars away from Joe and keep it for myself. Even though it's not real restitution, we're just doing it to keep Joe from keeping it. We don't want Joe to have it. And when we do things to prevent Joe's or anybody else's unjust enrichment, we often label that as quasi contract. So this uh, auction that we're talking about now has a couple of names. One name is quasi-contract. You can see why it would be called quasi-contract because it is a device 
to prevent unjust enrichment. And quasi-contract is kind of a broad term that's used for almost anything that prevents unjust enrichment. So getting that thousand dollars from Joe is often called a suit for a quasi-contract. It's got another name called equitable restitution. Equitable restitution. Now, you can see that it, you need this term equitable because it's not ordinary restitution. Restitution is when you give people back their stuff. You know, eject me, you gave me back my real property. Replevin, you gave me back my personal property. Self-help, I got back my property. Constructive trust, the court made you the trustee and made you give it back to me that way. Equitable lien, I can foreclose and, and, and get my money. I uh, hear uh, equitable restitution. I'm not getting my own stuff back. I'm just keeping you from keeping it, keeping Joe from keeping it. That's called equitable restitution. Now, the way this comes up on the bar is uh, not so much, and it can obviously come up in the case where you hired Joe to beat me up, but the more common situation where this comes up is as follows. Uh, it has to do with inducing breach of contract is the most commonly comes up. So here's the situation. Um, uh, uh, you own a, a manufacturing company and you hire engineers at your manufacturing company. Now, um, you, um, you just hired Mary as an engineer at your manufacturing company and she's supposed to start to work in two weeks. And now I come to you during this two-week period, and I say to you, uh, I'm a headhunter. I'm a person who places people in jobs for pay. And I say to you, you know what? I know you just hired Mary, and she's supposed to start work in a couple of weeks, but let me tell you, you should breach that contract with Mary. I induce you, encourage you. Breach the contract with Mary, and hire the person that I'm representing, hire John, who is also a great engineer. And not only that, let me tell you, John is connected. John has got, you know, the connections directed to the White House, and with the Defense Department, and blah, blah, blah. And so you're better off if you hire John. And so you, the employer, say, okay, so you breached the contract with Mary. Obviously, I am guilty of inducing breach of contract. I've committed a tort, intentional tort. And now you hire John instead of Mary. So you have breached the contract with Mary, and I have induced you to breach that contract. Now, John pays me a thousand dollars or something for finding him a job. Mary finds out about all this. What does Mary do? Mary sues you for breach of contract. None of us would have any problem with that. And Mary sues me for inducing the breach of contract. Okay? She just brings out the elements and proves that I did it. And she can get her damages. She can also get punitive damages for inducing breach of contract. Okay? So she can get compensatory damages for me for inducing the breach. She can get punitive damages because it's an intentional tort. If I did it with malice, she can get punitive damages. But you know what? I got paid a thousand dollars to commit this intentional tort. Sean paid me a thousand dollars to find him a job. Are you going to let me keep that thousand dollars? Well, the answer is no. I got paid to commit an intentional tort, and that is unjust enrichment. The public policy is against me getting rich that way. And so when Mary sues me for inducing breach of contract, so Mary sues me for inducing breach of contract, she can get her damages, her compensatory damages, she can get punitive damages, and she can sue me under equitable restitution or quasi-contract, whichever you want to call it, and she can use that to collect the $1,000 I got paid because it's unjust to let me keep it. So that's another way, another type of restitution, equitable restitution. Uh, there's one more way to get your stuff back. Uh, can't you get a mandatory injunction 
or the court orders the person, go give it back to them. So you could have a mandatory injunction. And then that does it. So, so far, we have uh, for our torts, damages, restitution, look for all of these, and finally, the injunction. Now, this injunction here, the mandatory injunction, is just giving back my stuff, the court telling the person to give it back their stuff. Here, I'm talking about the case where you want to prevent a continuing tort. The person is trespassing over your land every day. You want an injunction to tell them to stop doing it. Um, you, uh, so if you want uh, to enjoin someone's conduct, this is the type of injunction we're talking about here. Three branches to that that we need to know about, and those are number one, the TRO, temporary restraining order. Number two, the preliminary injunction. And number three, just a regular injunction. People sometimes call it a permanent injunction. That's misleading, just the injunction. Because it may not be so permanent. So we need to know what's required to get each of these. Well, to understand what's required, let's look at the function that these serve. First, the TRO. What function does the TRO serve? Well, the answer is that TRO stands for Temporary Restraining Order. And let me suppose that you have a house that the city is acquiring by eminent domain, and they claim they own it by eminent domain. You say, no, you don't. Something is wrong with the paperwork. You don't own it. And the bulldozers have come to your house, and they're on their way down the street to bulldoze your house down. And so you want to stop. Well, you might lay down in front of the bulldozers. You're brave enough to do that. But ultimately, you want a court order. So your lawyer runs off the court, or you are the lawyer, and your client lays down in front of the bulldozers, and you go to court, and you say, Your Honor, we need a temporary restraining order. Stop the bulldozers while we figure out what's going on here. Okay, that's your temporary restraining order. You can get it, number one, you get it ex party. If you can serve the other party and have them appear, so much the better, but you don't have to if you can't get them. You can still get a temporary restraining order and run back to the bulldozer driver and say, turn off your engine. That's your temporary restraining order. What do you need to get that temporary restraining order? Well, you need a situation where the, where if you don't act now, that the, your, your, your rights will be destroyed. You can bulldoze the house and then tell them to undo it, it's too late. So you need a situation where you must preserve the status quo. And you need to do it in, imminently, an emergency situation. So TRO rule where you must preserve the status quo and you can do it ex party without serving the other side if you can't find them and get your temporary restraining order in order to preserve the status quo. Now, once you have a temporary restraining order, of course, and that's on the only, they're, they're very short-lived, and none of them are beyond 10 days. It's just a few days long, saying, okay, we're going to hold up things here for a few days while both sides now come to court and make a quick analysis of what's going on. Now, this is not like coming to court for a full-blown trial, because you couldn't get prepared for trial in three, four, five days. But this is a preliminary hearing. We're right here now. This is a preliminary hearing where the courts are going to hear, uh, well, you know, preliminary arguments about what each side is claiming. And when, if you are the person who got the TRO, you're going to this preliminary hearing asking the court to continue the TRO, whereas the other side is asking the court to dissolve the TRO. And that's what the preliminary hearing is going to be about. One side wants to continue it, the other side wants to dissolve it. Uh, 
even if you don't have the TRO because there never was that kind of an emergency, you can go to court for the preliminary injunction saying we need to maintain the status quo so it's not an emergency situation, but you still have a preliminary hearing on maintaining the status quo. Uh, now, uh, so what do you need if you have a TRO? What do you need to convince the court at the preliminary hearing that they should continue the TRO? The answer is that to convince the court that they should continue the TRO, number one, you need to establish, of course, that the uh, uh, that the uh, that you must maintain the status quo. That if you don't maintain the status quo, the remedy will be useless. The house will be torn down, whatever it is. So you need to convince the court you must maintain the status quo. Number two, you need to convince the court that uh, you have a credible case, so that you are likely to prevail at trial. So if the court believes that you have a credible claim, likely to prevail at trial, is what I mean. The court concludes you are likely to prevail at trial and that it must maintain the status quo in order for your claim to have any value. Okay, that's what you have to prove at the preliminary hearing. Finally, at the final, the big time hearing to decide whether or not to dissolve the preliminary injunction or not, uh, now is when you have to prove uh, I'm, I put five bucks down. Let's put this on the board here. I P F B D. I put five bucks down. It's going to do this a little better. I P. Okay. I P F B D. In case you're having trouble reading this, people use the mnemonic. I put five bucks down. People also use the mnemonic, I prefer free-based drugs, uh, all of which work, helps to remember it. Uh, the I stands for inadequate remedy at law. The I stands for inadequate remedy at law. P stands for property right, but you and I know that historically you had to be trying to enforce a property right that's not required anymore. You can enforce your constitutional rights in this way. And that's not property. F, feasible to enforce. The injunction must be feasible to enforce. Uh, if you give an affirmative injunction telling somebody to do something, many times that's not feasible to enforce. Negative injunctions are much more feasible to enforce. B, balance the equities. The B for balancing the equities. Well, um, the notice that you don't have the B in specific performance. Over here on the other side, when we're looking at specific performance, I'm doing fine, mom and dad. There's no B in here for balancing the equities. And the reason you don't have a B for balancing the equities is because in the breach of contract case, the parties have already bargained with each other in some way. Okay. And so uh, the, uh, they've already reached the bargain, and what you're doing here is kind of enforcing that bargain. So you don't need to rebalance the equities. They did that already in their bargaining. On the other hand, when you look over here at the case of a tort remedy, the parties have not bargained with each other. And if you force one party to do something, uh, you might the equities might be quite unfair. So you need to look at what benefit is a benefited party going to get out of this and how much harm is it going to do to the person who's got to comply with the injunction. So you've got to balance the equities to be fair here because the parties have not bargained in the tort case. And finally, the defenses, the defenses to equitable to this injunction are latches, just like before, unclean hands, equity does not enjoin crime, First Amendment, That's my problem. So, um, 
This is what tort remedies are all about. Let me run through this once again. Tort remedies, there are three sets, uh, three classes of them. Damages, restitution, injunction. For the damages, there are only two subcategories. Compensatory damages or punitive damages. Restitution, all of these subcategories here of restitution that we talked about, and injunction, the TRO, the preliminary injunction, and the injunction itself. Now, we need to go back for a moment to damages so we can talk more about the ACFU and, dam and uh, damages, tort damages. Tort damages must be actual, actual in amount means not too speculative, just like before. The actual for tort law and the actual for contract law means exactly the same thing. Actual means not too speculative in amount. C, causal. In the case of contract law, the damage must be caused by the breach. In the case of tort law, the damage must be caused by the tort. Actual causal, foreseeable. Now here's where things begin to differ. In the case of foreseeability in tort law, what we really are talking about here, foreseeable, this is proximate cause. Proximate cause is what we really mean. And what we mean is that if you are going to collect damages for someone, that damage must be proximately caused by the tort. That makes sense. Uh, and we all know the rule that if I um, commit a tort today and that tort causes A, my conduct of some item A, and A causes B, causes C, causes D, causes E, causes L, causes G, well, you know that long before you get to G, my liability is going to come to an end. Because the public policy says I'm just, you just, we're just not going to hold people liable for this kind of a chain as it gets more and more remote. you got to stop liability somewhere, and we're just not going to carry it that far. And so long before we get that far, my liability will have ended because the public policy says we're not going to make you pay for that. And when you get to the point in this chain where the public policy says I don't have to pay for anything beyond that chain, every, beyond that point, everything beyond that point we say we got several names for the stuff beyond the point where I don't have to pay anymore. And let's talk about that. The uh, uh, beyond the point where I don't have to pay anymore, we say that harm was not foreseeable, so I don't have to pay for it. We say that harm was not proximately caused. Okay, it was caused, but you know, even though I caused all the way out to G, because everything out to G wouldn't have happened if I hadn't committed my tort. So even though I actually caused all this stuff, legally I'm not the cause. So we say, I'm not the legal cause. We say, my conduct is not the proximate cause. We say that harm was not foreseeable. All of these are just different ways of saying, it's too far out the chain, I don't have to pay for it. Now, so what happens in a tort case is that I pay up until some point, and then beyond that point, I'm not the proximate cause anymore, and I don't have to pay. Now, the, uh, 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 then, uh, in, uh, so if you ask the question, in contract law, how far out the chain do I pay? And the answer in contract law is Hadley versus Axon there. That I pay for the general damages. The general damages are the standard measure of damages for this kind of contract. You know, if I don't deliver the car, you get the difference in price. If I don't deliver the widgets, you get the difference in price. If I don't build your house, you get somebody else to build it. If I build it late, you get, you get a lost rent from me, and so forth. Those are the standard measure of damages. Those are considered always foreseeable in contract law, the standard measure of damages. So in contract law, if I breach the contract, you get the standard measure of damages, and if you want anything beyond that, you have to make it foreseeable when the contract was formed. If you don't make it foreseeable to me when the contract was formed, uh, in time for me to take that into account in setting my price. If you don't make it foreseeable, you can't select it. Whereas in tort law, when I commit a tort, I pay out to the point where the harm is 
no longer legally caused, and that's what the, you have to use the case law to get some sense of where that place is. Beyond that place, I'm not the legal cause, I'm not the proximate cause, that harm wasn't foreseeable, however you want to say it, I don't have to pay it. Also, finally, in tort law, if there's an intervening event that came in, not just a long chain like I was talking about, but some intervening event came in, that if that event, event ends my liability, that's called a superseding event. So in tort law, you often have to evaluate this event and decide whether or not it was superseding. If it is, I don't have to pay anymore. If it was not superseding, I keep on paying. Okay. And so that's how the chain works in tort law, and that's how it works in contract law. Let's take a break and come back at uh, 13 minutes after.